Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the lecture for chapter 25. We're going to be talking about transfer taxes and wealth planning. So to give some history to what we're going to be talking about, in the early 1900s, Congress created the estate tax on transfers of property at death, right? Let's assume somebody was to pass away. They owned a bunch of property that they've accumulated during their life. They then transferred this property at the time of their death through their will. Uh, Congress would impose a tax on that, the value of the tax being based on uh, the amount that was transferred. So these transfers, namely those you make at death, are called testamentary transfers. And roughly 15 years later, they expanded this to say that, hey, we're also going to impose a tax on transfers of property that you make during your life, right? Those are called inter vivos transfers. And when they created these two taxes, people were finding you know, loopholes to get around them. The most specific thing they were doing was transferring the assets, you know, maybe a grandparent to grandson to avoid that additional layer of taxation if they were to transfer it instead from like grandparent to son to grandson. And when they found these loopholes, Congress imposed this generation skipping tax, the GST. So these three taxes, right? The estate tax on transfers you make at death, uh, the gift tax for lifetime transfers you make, and the GST, these are all known as transfer taxes. They're separate from the income tax. So like in the same way that sales tax is a separate tax from income tax, property tax is a freestanding tax. We have a separate freestanding tax known as transfer taxes. So while the estate and gift tax were originally separate taxes, in around uh, the mid 70s, they unified them into a single transfer tax formula where they basically look at the gifts you've made during your life, plus the transfers you made at your death, right? And they're gonna combine those two to figure out what if any tax liability you're gonna owe on that. Now, this is a very simple uh, way of showing the transfer tax formula where they combined it Right? Essentially, they're going to have your lifetime gifts plus the transfers of property you make at your death. Right, That's going to give you your total transfers, multiply it times the tax rate, give you your liability. Then you're going to back out credits right, to reduce that liability dollar for dollar. The most important one here is called the applicable credit or the unified credit. And essentially with this, it's uh, the point of this is to limit who ultimately is gonna be and have a gift tax or estate tax liability. In other words, the credit here is giant. It's like millions of dollars. So um, with that, right, uh, essentially the estate and gift tax is only gonna apply to really, really rich people who give a lot of property. In other words, the average Joes of the world, uh, if we die and give gifts during our life and at our death, uh, while we may have made uh, transfers of property, we didn't make enough such that we would owe a liability after we considered the applicable credit. So this is just talking about the applicable credit. Right, it's really meant to reduce the number of individuals who actually have to pay the estate and gift tax. So again, it's like really only millionaires uh, who are subject to this. One of the kind of corresponding principles to the applicable credit is this thing called the exemption equivalent or sometimes called the applicable exclusion amount. Essentially what this says is how many gifts or transfers of property can I cumulatively make during my life plus at my death such that I will be protected by the applicable credit and I won't have a transfer tax liability. So for example, in 2021, if you were to pass away or you made you know, cumulative gifts 
basically, if it was anything that you gave throughout your entire life and at your death, if it was below 11700000 the applicable credit would wipe it all out. You wouldn't have uh, any tax on that. So this right here is just showing the exemption equivalent you know, between years. You can see one of the important things here is right from 2017 to 2018, they almost and basically doubled it, uh, the amount you can give. This was part of tax reform. You know, they, they give benefits, they take benefits away. And essentially what this now does is even though before it was like 5 million, it's now 11 million. So you can see, right, how you have to give a lot of gifts before you're actually going to get hit with that transfer tax. So one of the kind of mechanics with this where it can get a little tricky is when you're valuing the applicable credit, you have to look at the transfer tax rate and the exemption equivalent that applied in the year of transfer. So in other words, right, we'll look at the gifts you make in year one, year two, year three, plus the current year, right? Those are your lifetime gifts that you made. However, there could be a different uh, exemption equivalent, right, when you're looking at those years, right? Because we just looked at the last slide and um, we can see that it changed from year to year. So, because these change over time, these dynamics, when we calculate the applicable credit, we have to convert the exemption equivalent using the current tax rate schedule. So for example, the exemption equivalent was like $5 million uh, in 2011. We just looked at that at the last slide. When we evaluate a prior year transfer, you know, perhaps made in 2011, for determining the current year gift tax, the applicable credit for 2011 is going to be 1945000 In other words, we calculate it using the current year tax rates, not the rates in 2011. So we use prior year exemption equivalent, but we calculate the credit from that based off the current year tax rates. And then I have here, right, the exemption equivalent for 2021 is $11.7 million. The applicable credit for that is $4,600,000, right? So there's a couple features we have to be aware of with transfer taxes. Uh, first, there's two common deductions. We'll look at them more specifically charitable contributions, uh, marital deductions. Why they do this is, uh, you know, they're going to allow you to deduct those from your transfers for public policy purposes. In other words, if you give to a charity, right, we're not going to um, you know, tax that. If you leave your estate to your spouse or something, right, technically that is a transfer of property. Someone could say, oh, husband dies and leaves everything to wife. Um, is that going to be you know, subject to the estate tax or the gift tax. Well, we have deductions for those for public policy purposes. Another feature would be the, how we value uh, property that's given. Generally, we're gonna use the fair market value based on the facts and circumstances. What an arm's length transaction would be. What could we sell this piece of property for? That's how we're gonna value it when we're looking at um, transfers made. So if we were to look here a little bit more specifically at the gift tax, right, we do know that they are combined, they're ultimately combined into a single formula, but you may have to file a federal gift tax return each year if you make taxable gifts uh, in that year. So let's kind of think of it like this way, right? Um, first off, it's taxable gifts right? And we will see what rises to the level of being taxable and whether it's a gift or not. But assuming you gave gifts, right? Let's just say you gave $30,000 in gifts this year. Yes, and taxable gifts. Yes, you may in that case have to file a gift tax return 
for the year, the Form 709. Um, however, just because you file it doesn't mean you're actually going to have to pay tax on it in that year. It's almost like a historical record keeping purpose. Oh, you gave 30,000 in year one, 200,000 in year two, 300,000 in year three. Yes, for each of those years, you're gonna have to file a gift tax return, but we still have that giant overarching applicable credit that uh, is gonna wipe out any obligation on it. So that's one thing we have to keep in mind with the gift tax return. Um, you may have to file it throughout your life, but it doesn't mean that you're actually gonna have to pay tax on those gifts. So if we have a simplified view here of the gift tax return, it's basically your gross gifts minus any exclusion, gives you your taxable gifts for the current year, add any prior year taxable gifts, that's gonna get you your total taxable transfers. And again, we have this you know, giant overarching credit here that's gonna wipe out normally any obligation. Most of the time when we're doing the 709, it's more for record keeping purposes so that we have uh, an understanding in later years, what were all our taxable gifts that we made? If we didn't do this and the IRS wasn't aware of this, it would be hard you know, when you die, when you do like the single uh, form that combines both the estate and gift tax to really know what your prior year taxable gifts would be. So we're gonna look at, you know, first off, what is a gift? Um, you know, what rises to the level of a gift? And we're gonna look at exclusions afterwards, things that you can uh, kind of subtract out. Now, this is a more um, like in-depth look at it, uh, the gift tax return. But essentially, if we're, we're starting with the gift tax return and we're thinking of this as kind of like a record keeping type return, we only have to file it if we have taxable gifts. Uh, what is a gift, right? Well, essentially it's a transfer of property that's out of detached and disinterested generosity. There's no consideration. So for example, if your parents uh, gave you money to uh, buy textbooks or something, right? They're doing that out of a detached and disinterested generosity. They're not expecting anything in return. Here you go, please take this as a gift and buy the textbooks. In distinction, what wouldn't be a gift is if they said something like, here's money for textbooks uh, if you were to cut the grass, right? Because then there's consideration involved. Consideration basically means uh, like this for that, quid pro quo, uh, you're giving up or receiving something in return for uh, having and, and giving this gift. So that's the first thing. What is the definition of a gift? It has to be you know, detached and disinterested. There can't be any consideration. Likewise, it has to be a completed gift or a perfected gift. Basically, what this means is uh, it has to be no strings attached. There can't be any type of way that, that the donor, the person making the gift, can claw the gift back. Uh, if they retain any type of power or control to use the property, then it's gonna be an incomplete gift. Um, so let's look here at 25.1. This is gonna show Okay, so it looks like uh, during the year, Harry transfers 250 grand of stock to a trust. He gave the trustees directions to pay income to Dina uh, for the next 20 years and then remit the remainder to her son, George. Harry named a bank as a trustee, but he retained the power to revoke the trust in case he should need additional assets after retirement. Is this a transfer of stock a complete gift? Well, in this case, right? Even though he put it in a trust for Dina uh, and then to Dina's son, he didn't release full control of it. In other words, he retained the power to revoke the trust at any given point, right? Um, it would be like giving a gift with strings attached. That's not a complete gift. A gift uh, is you, when you give it, it's no longer yours. You can't touch it. You don't have control over it. Next, it says, suppose $11,000 uh, from the trust was distributed to Dina at year end. 
is this transfer of cash to Dina a complete gift? Well, in this case, yes. Uh, they've actually given the money to her. He can't get it back at this point in time. Uh, so it is a complete gift. Finally here, it says, suppose Harry releases his power to revoke the trust at a time when the shares of the trust are valued at 225. Would this release cause the transfer of stock to be a complete gift? And if so, what is the amount of the gift? Well, in this case, yeah, it would uh, make it a complete gift. He no longer has control over it. It's fully sitting in the trust. He can't get it back in any way. We're gonna use the fair market value at the date that gift was completed, namely $225,000. So some of the things that aren't gifts, right? Exclusions, right? Uh, political contributions, we aren't going to count these as gifts. So if you give money to the Biden campaign, the Trump campaign, that's not going to be a gift. Payments of another's medical or educational expenses are not a gift. Here's the catch with them though. You have to make it directly to the healthcare provider or educational institution. For example, let's just say father gives son $10,000 for college. Um, and then son takes that money and he pays his tuition, right? In that case, that's a gift, right? Because we've given him money. Um, you know, we have no control over it at that point in time. There you go. In distinction, right, compare that with this example, father pays son's tuition directly, gives SUNY a check for $10,000. In that case, because they're paying education directly to the educational institution, it's not gonna be a gift. We don't have to put it in the pot when we're uh, you know, imposing any gift tax or state tax. Finally here, a transfer of property in connection with a divorce is not a gift if the property is transferred within three years of the divorce under a written property decree. We do have some special rules here if it's a life insurance policy. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be as worried about this for the exam. If we look at it here, it says, for a gift of a life insurance policy, the donor must give the donee all incidents of ownership including the power to designate beneficiaries. Okay, that kind of goes with the theme of we have to give everything over. One thing I have here is an individual who creates a joint tenancy in property with someone who does not provide consideration for their interest in the property is deemed to make a gift. Uh, and as I have here, and I'll explain it, it says the gift in this case is the amount necessary to pay for the other party's interest in the property. The donor is deemed to make a gift of 30K to the donee using these facts, namely the difference between the value of the joint interest and the consideration provided by the donee. So essentially what they're talking about here uh, is a joint tenancy. It's a, a way of describing a legal relationship over property. Uh, joint tenancy uh, would be like equal ownership. If we look here at 25.2, this will you know, flesh it out a little bit more, the joint tenancy. Okay, so it says this year, Harry helped purchase a residence for Dina and her husband, Steve. The price of the residence was 250 grand and the title named Harry and Steve as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. Harry provided 210 of the purchase price and Steve paid 40. Has Harry made a complete gift and if so, in what amount? Well, in this case, uh, we can see here that it's a joint tenancy, right? And it looks like it was valued at, and it was sold at 250. And if it's a joint tenancy, it means they're equal owners. So they each own half, 125 grand. In this case then, how we calculate the gift is gonna be the difference um, by basically the ownership interest of 125 grand minus the 40 grand that uh, you know, Steve in this case paid. So it's gonna be 85 grand is the amount of a gift uh, that Harry made to Steve. It says, suppose Steve didn't provide any part of the purchase price for his half of the interest. 
what is the amount of the gift? So Steve is just labeled as a joint tenant on this property. If you're a joint tenant, you're gonna own half of it. You have an equal right. He didn't pay anything for this, right? So basically what he got in this case, he stood on the sideline and he got something worth 125,000. So Harry in that case made a gift of 125,000. And it's different if Steve puts money into the pot, right? The amount of gift in that case is gonna be the difference between uh, that 125 and the 40 Steve put in. Valuation, right? So we said uh, one way that we can value gifts is when it's like simple and it's like, here you go, here's a piece of property right now. However, gifts aren't always made in that capacity, right? Um, they could be like annuities uh, or future payments. So as I have here, right, we have to understand how to value a gift if it's a series of payments over a time or if it's a payment to be made in the future. Basically, the idea here is we have to distinguish a present interest from a future interest. So if you have the right to currently enjoy or receive income, then it's a present interest. In contrast, right, the right to receive income or property in the future is a future interest. Um, so a, a present interest may just be something like, here is the land, you own the land, right? It's given to you, you have the present interest to use it, right? In distinction, a future interest may be something like, I will give you the land, here is the land that you will get in 10 years, right? Uh, you only get that interest in 10 years. Now, one of the things with present interest is they can't, you know, sometimes they don't last forever. They can be um, cut short after a certain period of time or a certain event happens. In that case, they would be called uh, terminable interests. They're capable of being terminable, terminated. So maybe I could give you the land or the, the house for, you know, here is the land, you have it now, but you get it for a five year period. So that's a terminable interest. Yes, it's a present interest, but after five years, it ends. So it's cut short. That's in distinction to a future interest. I will give you the land, you know, in 10 years from now, or, you know, upon the event of something happening. Uh, one of the things here is if you receive the right to possess or receive income for the duration of your life, that's called a life estate. Um, it's a type of terminal interest. Basically, hey, here's the land, you can have it for life, then I'm going to give it to your brother or something. What you have is a present interest that's a life estate. So at the end of a terminable interest, right, the property is going to pass to another person. Now, who it goes to, whether it's the person who originally made the gift or a third party, um, it's going to be that that interest is going to be called either a reversion or a remainder. So, for example, right, um, let's just say I'm giving you land. Um, let's just say here is land. You can have it for five years. Right. That's a terminable interest. At the end of the five years, it comes back to me. Right. So I have a property interest in that. It's called a reversion. It reverts back to me, the donor. In distinction, if I said to you, uh, here's the land for five years, then it goes to your brother, right? In that case, your brother um, is going to, to have a remainder interest. He's going to be called a remainder man. So it's just understanding the parties in this situation, a reversion versus a remainder. Um, now, as I have here, future interests are common when property is placed in a trust. If we're talking about trusts, we have a grantor and a trustee, as well as a beneficiary. There's normally three parties. A grantor is the person who establishes the trust. The trustee is the one who administers it. Uh, and then who are they administering it for? The beneficiary. And uh, normally in these cases, right, let's just imagine uh, if we want to give a simple example of a trust, what it might be. Maybe um, husband and wife have a son. Let's just say they, uh, the son has issues and he can't take care of himself. 
they may set up a trust such where they put you know money in the trust they would be the grantor they would have the trustee administer this trust and that trust may make periodic payments to the son who's the beneficiary uh, that might be an ex a simple example of a trust why it's created now if we have a future interest it's essentially a promise uh, of a future payment we would estimate uh, the value of that. We basically discount it to its present value. You can look at 25.3. There's not gonna be any time value of money questions on the exam. Up front, you know, here, what we're really looking at uh, is just some terminology, right? We looked at, um, you know, the different types of like, what is a gift, what doesn't count as a gift, exclusions, specific instances, uh, you know, with life insurance, with joint tenancy property. Uh, then we looked at gifts that are made over a period of time. We need to distinguish their present interest from a future interest. Um, you know, present interest could be a terminable interest where it's cut short. One type of terminal interest is a life estate. Then we said at the end of the terminable interest, uh, whoever it goes to, the original person who made a gift, or um, a third party, they would be, uh, that, would, that would be a reversion or a remainder, right? So the next item here that's uh, relevant if we were going back to the simple formula here, right? We've looked at these, uh, we've looked at some of these. Now we're gonna look at this 15,000 per year because this is like a common thing uh, that people you know, don't understand. So the idea with this is, right, there's something called the annual gift exclusion. And basically the exclusion is available to offset a gift made to each donee. So it's not 15 total, it's 15 per person uh, per year that you can give that can be excluded. So as I have here, for example, a donor could give 15000 in cash to 10 donees without exceeding the annual exclusion. That is, each donee receives a $15,000 exclusion. It's kind of like this, right? Let's just say that you're a millionaire, right? And you don't want to pay this gift tax or estate tax, right? And let's say you have 30 grandchildren and nieces and nephews, right? 30 individuals each year. One thing you could do, right, in order to avoid paying gift tax, right, because I'm sitting on these millions of dollars, I don't want it to be taxed, what can I do? I can give any individual each year $15,000 and it's excluded for that individual, right, each individual. So what I would do is uh, every year over maybe the next 10 years, however much time I have left to live, right, whatever you know the situation is, I'm going to give 15 grand to each of them uh, so that I can get the annual exclusion on that. And then that ultimately will save me gift tax because I'll have less to transfer at my death. Right. So they're kind of giving uh, a small number here of 15 grand that you can give each year per person that's excluded. Uh, let's look here at 25 4. So it looks like uh, we have Harry, he puts 500 grand of stock into a trust. He simultaneously made two taxable gifts, a life estate to Dina and a remainder to George. Okay, so basically um, he gave in this case um, $500,000 of which 440 is gonna be valued as a life estate to Dina and the remainder, right, goes to George. So if we're looking at this, uh, Dina is going to have a life estate, basically to Dina for life, then to George. And George is going to be the remainder man, right, if we're applying that terminology from before. So we're just seeing that shake out here. It says, what is the amount of the taxable gift of the life estate and the remainder interest to George after taking the annual exclusion into account? Okay, so 
Dina's life estate is a present interest and would qualify for the annual exclusion. Okay, there we go, $15,000. That's how much taxable gift we made in this year to Dina. We would report it on there. In distinction, right, George, in this case, is gonna have a future interest. He has that remainder that he's, uh, you know, waiting on. He gets it after Dina passes away. Here's the deal though with the exclusion, right? It only applies to present interests. Generally, future interests are not gonna be eligible for that annual exclusion. There's a minor exception there, but that doesn't play here. So in this case, right, if we're valuing the 500,000, we say Dina's is worth 440, George's future interest is worth 59, that gets us to the 500. Dina's is a present value or is a present interest, so we get that exclusion, the $15,000 per person per year, takes us down to 425. George has a future interest. We don't get the annual exclusion. We're gonna keep it that 59, add them together, that's the 485. So, As I have here, right, we'll pause after you know, another slide or so. I don't want to make this too long. Uh, current gifts are accumulated for each donee made during the current year. As indicated, current gifts exclude certain types of transfers of property. So, right, like medical expenses, directly paid, education, charity. And we also have that exclusion amount, right? Um, one of the things that couples can do is they can split gifts. Um, so basically in that case, half of each gift would be included in their current gifts of each spouse. Um, and then as I have here, the marital deduction for gifts between spouses and charity, medical and tuition are the last adjustment. So, okay, so we talked about you know, charity, medical, tuition. So with that, right, we're gonna say we arrive at taxable gifts. And if we just go back here and we look at it, again, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the gift tax return. We're saying the main reason we do this is kind of keep, to keep a historical record of the gifts that we made during our life such that when we ultimately pass away, we have our gifts from our life plus the gifts from our death, uh, and then we can figure out what tax we owe on it. Now, when we're looking at our gifts from our life, right, we said part of the reason uh, we are you know, doing this as record keeping, because we're gonna, it's possible that you could, you know, if you gave $12 million in gifts during the current year, yes, then you would have a liability on it. But most of the time, uh, you know, this applicable credit is gonna wipe out any obligation you have. So um, yes, you may have the obligation to file the tax return if you have taxable gifts, right? So if you reach this level right here, then you do have to file a gift tax return. But reaching that level, first off, means you made a gift, right? It was uh, a transfer of property which, with detached and disinterested uh, motives. That is to say, it's not incomplete. You didn't retain any kind of control or it was a revocable trust. As well as once we establish that number, we have to back out any exclusions for, uh, you know, between spouses, uh, direct payments for education or medical, and when we look at the gifts we give to each person, uh, we can wipe off 15,000 per year per donee. Here's the deal though, right? If you just give 18,000, let's say the only gift you made during the year was 18,000, then uh, you know, 15 would be wiped, but you would have to report three as a gift. And that's where, this is where people always um, kind of get confused with this. They always say, well, if I give more, because they, they always hang on this 15,000 number. Um, they're like, I can't give any more than 15,000 per year because then I have to pay taxes on the gift. Well, no, the like yes and no, that's true. If you pay more than 15,000 a year, it doesn't mean you're gonna pay tax, or if you give more than 15,000 a year, it doesn't mean that you're gonna owe gift tax uh, necessarily. In fact, you probably won't. What it really means is it triggers a gift tax filing obligation because you've made taxable gifts. So yeah, you can give 18 to somebody. Um, it's not a big deal because guess what? 15 of that's gonna be wiped. 
the remaining three you report is not anywhere near close to that $11 million exemption equivalent. In other words, you'll be fully protected uh, by the applicable credit. So with that, we'll pause this lecture here and we'll pick it up on uh, the next slide.